In this video, we're going to look at how we transport oxygen and carbon dioxide through the bloodstream. So first I want to look at what is the proportion of molecules that's in our atmosphere. So when we're breathing air, how much of it is oxygen? Right? So oxygen makes up about 21% or 20.09% of our atmosphere. And the majority of the rest of the gas is actually nitrogen, which we don't use. We don't use nitrogen that we breathe. We have to consume nitrogen from eating plants or animals. So the nitrogen that we breathe in, we just breathe right back out again. And the oxygen that we breathe in, then we use that. That will diffuse into our bloodstream. And then we produce carbon dioxide when we have metabolism. So the whole point of breathing in oxygen is so that our cells, the mitochondria of our cells, can use that oxygen to make ATP, or energy. Now during that process, we produce carbon dioxide as a waste product, and then we have to breathe that out. And there is a percentage of the atmosphere, a very tiny percentage, that is made up of carbon dioxide as well as other trace minerals. So if we look at this chart, this just shows you some of the molecules that are present in our air. So about 78% is nitrogen, about 21% is oxygen, and then we have other trace elements. Now, in the last video, we looked at Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law, to recall, is when we increase the volume of a container of air, then we are going to decrease the pressure. And when we decrease the volume, we will increase the pressure. And that is what allows us to move air in and out of our lungs. So the next law I want to look at is called Dalton's Law. And this is the partial pressures of each gas in a mixture is equal to the sum of the total pressure. So when we have an atmospheric pressure of about 760 millimeters of mercury, again, at sea level, no storms, nothing weird, okay, about 760 millimeters of mercury, that total is made up of the partial pressures of nitrogen and oxygen and the trace elements. So we can calculate the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere. So if oxygen makes up about 21% of our atmosphere and our atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, what is the partial pressure of just oxygen in our atmosphere? When we calculate the partial pressure of oxygen, we are going to multiply the atmospheric pressure of 760 times 21% or 0.209 to give us a partial pressure of 158.8 or somewhere around 160 millimeters of mercury of atmospheric pressure is composed of oxygen. And you could calculate the same thing for carbon dioxide, and you can calculate the partial pressure of nitrogen as well. 21% of our air is oxygen, and about 160 millimeters of mercury of pressure is oxygen. Now, when, when we've evolved to adapt to that concentration of oxygen, so now when we're breathing air in, what is the available partial pressure of oxygen that can move into our capillaries? So remember in the last video, we talked about how there's a dead air space. So there is going to be a bit of mixing of fresh air with air that is in our conducting zone. So by the time the air that we breathe gets to the capillaries, that partial pressure has actually decreased a little bit and it now is around 100 millimeters of mercury of pressure, of partial pressure of oxygen that can diffuse into the capillaries. So now I just want to show you a diagram to compare the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood, in the lungs, compared to when it circulates throughout the body and gets to the tissues and then is used by our cells to make ATP. Okay, so let's look at the difference in the partial pressure in the lungs compared to the tissues. 
So the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere, in the air that we breathe, assuming it's dry air and it's not full of moisture, is about 160 millimeters of mercury. Now when we inhale that oxygen, and then it's going to diffuse into the capillaries in the lungs, it is going to be around 100, 100 millimeters of mercury. And that's because it is being diluted with air that's in the dead space. So in the lungs, the partial pressure is around 100, then it is going to circulate through the body. And recall that it's going to circulate to the heart, and then the heart, the left side of the heart, will pump it out to all of the tissues in the body. Now over here in the tissues, once our cells use oxygen, that partial pressure down here is going to decrease from 100 in the lungs to around 40 in the tissues. Now what's important to note here is that it's never zero. Okay, we never use all of the oxygen in our blood. So there's always extra available if we ever need to have a burst of more energy production and we need to have more oxygen, then it will be available. And then when we look at the carbon dioxide levels, the carbon dioxide levels actually don't change a significant amount. So in the tissues, where the tissues are making carbon dioxide, the partial pressure in our blood is about 46 millimeters of mercury and then it's going to circulate through the venous system to the right side of the heart and then it's going to go back to the lungs and it is going to end up then we breathe off this carbon dioxide and it will decrease to around 40. So the carbon dioxide levels go from about 46 to about 40 and the oxygen partial pressure changes from about 100 to about 40 at the tissue level. Now the last law that I want to talk about, so we had Boyle's law, the volume and pressure are inversely proportional, Dalton's law, the partial pressures make up the sum total of the whole amount of partial or the whole amount of pressure. And then the last one is called Henry's law. And this is about the concentration of gases that will dissolve into our blood. So when we are breathing air that contains oxygen, if we increase the concentration of oxygen, let's suppose you put on an oxygen mask and you breathe more oxygen, then more oxygen will diffuse into the blood. So Henry's law is that the amount of gases that dissolve into a liquid is proportional to the concentration of that gas. So if we have more oxygen that we're breathing, more oxygen will diffuse into the blood. So in this example, we're just looking at the normal amount of air that we normally breathe, the amount that will diffuse in an atmosphere of 21% oxygen, but that will increase if someone wears an oxygen mask. Now, how do we transport oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout the blood? We have red blood cells. Red blood cells contain molecules called hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin is actually composed of four different proteins. We have four different proteins that combine to produce a hemoglobin molecule. And inside each hemoglobin protein, we have a molecule called heme. And in that heme is an iron molecule, Fe2+, and this is what oxygen will bind to. So each hemoglobin molecule can bind an oxygen on each heme molecule. So when we're transporting oxygen, about 98% of the oxygen that we transport will be on hemoglobin. And then the other 2% will be dissolved in the plasma. The plasma is the liquid portion of our blood. But when we, when we transport carbon dioxide, it's a little bit different. So we breathe oxygen in from the atmosphere, it's going to go to the alveoli, and then it is going to diffuse across the membranes, and it will combine with hemoglobin, and that will form oxyhemoglobin in the red blood cells. 
and the lungs. And then the blood is going to circulate to the tissues and then the oxygen will unbind from the hemoglobin and it will be used by the cells, by the mitochondria, to produce energy. When we are transporting carbon dioxide, it is a little bit different. Some carbon dioxide will combine with hemoglobin and some carbon dioxide will stay dissolved in the plasma. But we also transport carbon dioxide through this system called the bicarbonate buffer system. So when we produce carbon dioxide, that carbon dioxide is going to combine with a water molecule in our red blood cells with an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. That combination of carbon dioxide and water will produce carbonic acid. And then carbonic acid will dissociate and produce hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. So just like baking soda is sodium bicarbonate, right? It's a buffer. We can use it as a buffer system in our blood because our blood pH needs to stay very stable. The blood pH never varies very much more from about 7.35 to about 7.4 and it has to stay in that narrow window, otherwise our brain won't be able to function properly and we'll have a seizure or go into a coma. So it's very important to keep our blood pH regulated. Now, when we look over here at the tissue level, we produce carbon dioxide when we make energy. About 10% of the carbon dioxide that we transport will be dissolved in the plasma. About 25% will bind to hemoglobin. And then the majority of carbon dioxide, about 65%, will be transported as bicarbonate ions. So carbon dioxide and water forms carbonic acid, which will then dissociate into bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. Now the bicarbonate has a negative charge and it does not stay in the red blood cell. It is going to move out of the red blood cell. And because we are moving a molecule with a negative charge out, we have to move a molecule with a negative charge in so that the charge of the whole red blood cell membrane is not altered. This is called a chloride shift. So this chloride shift occurs in the red blood cell at the tissue level, then it will reverse in the lungs. So then the bicarbonate ions will move back in, the chloride will move back out, and this reaction will go in the opposite direction so that the carbon dioxide will then be exhaled. The carbon dioxide that's bound to hemoglobin will be released, and the carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the plasma, all of this will be exhaled in the lungs. Now, I want you to think about the pH of the blood. And I want you to think about what's gonna happen if you hold your breath. What will happen to your blood pH? Knowing that carbon dioxide produces carbonic acid. So, hold your breath. Let the carbon dioxide build up. What's happening to your blood pH? Is it going up or down? Okay, remember that when your pH goes up, it is becoming more alkaline, and when the pH goes down, it is becoming more acidic. So if you hold your breath, or you have hypoventilation, your blood pH is becoming more acidic. So what happens when you exercise? When you exercise and you produce carbon dioxide and you make lactic acid, and the blood pH starts to decrease and become acidic, how does our body deal with that? We increase our rate of respiration, right? So when your blood pH starts to become acidic, you're going to breathe more. And if you're exercising, it will be noticeable, but our breathing rate fluctuates all the time based on our blood pH. So the pH of the blood is actually a very strong signal for regulating our breathing rate. Now let's suppose you breathe too much, you breathe in and out a lot, you hyperventilate. 
Now what happens to your blood pH? When you hyperventilate, your blood pH is going to go up and it will become more alkaline. Okay, so note that our breathing rate has a very important role in regulating our blood pH. Now I want to look at how much oxygen is bound to the hemoglobin. So we're going to look at what is called the hemoglobin saturation curve. And I just want to point out a few things about this. So in our lungs, if we look at this red line, so in the lungs, in the blood in our lungs, the partial pressure of oxygen, remember, in the lungs is around 100 millimeters of mercury. And then in the tissues, it's around 40. Now, how much of the hemoglobin, what percentage is binding oxygen in the lungs compared to the tissues? So up here in the lungs, you can see that almost 100% of the hemoglobin is going to be bound with oxygen. And now if we go to the tissues and we see when we have 40 millimeters of mercury of pressure, of partial pressure of oxygen, our hemoglobin is actually still almost 80% saturated. So it's important to note that our hemoglobin is never fully empty of oxygen. We always have a little bit of a backup reserve of oxygen if we ever need it to make extra energy. Now, we have what is called a right shift and a left shift. And this is when the amount of oxygen that is bound to the hemoglobin is altered for some reason, which means oxygen will either stay bound more tightly or it will come off more easily. Now, I want to just look at this situation here. When we increase the amount of carbon dioxide, when we have more acid or we have an increase in temperature, these factors will cause a right shift, which means the oxygen will dissociate more easily. That means oxygen is going to come off of the hemoglobin more easily and go into the tissues. This right shift is going to happen. These things are going to happen when we are exercising. So we have a right shift during exercise. And we will have a left shift in the opposite conditions. So when oxygen is less, when we have lower oxygen, let's suppose you climb a mountain and the amount of oxygen is less. When acid decreases, so the blood becomes alkaline, or when you are very cold, then oxygen will stay bound to the hemoglobin more strongly. And that's logical. When we are exercising, we want the oxygen to come off of the hemoglobin more easily to go into the tissues so that we can make energy. Now, the very last thing that I want to mention is just a little bit about how we regulate our breathing. Now, there are two structures that are really important in regulating breathing. The main one is the medulla oblongata, the lower part of the brainstem. And then just above that, the middle part of the brainstem is called the pons. And the pons helps to smooth out our breathing rate. But the main respiratory center is the medulla oblongata, and that detects oxygen levels in the blood, carbon dioxide levels in the blood, and blood pH. So when there is more acid, more hydrogen ions, the medulla is going to stimulate the breathing muscles so that we can breathe more to help get rid of that carbon dioxide. So those are the two main structures, but there are a few other structures that are involved in regulating breathing. So actually first, I'm going to stick with the medulla for a second. We have reflexes. So let's suppose you have to cough or sneeze. Those are reflexes that are controlled by the medulla oblongata. Then we have voluntary control. We can hold our breath. That is using our cerebral cortex. So we can choose to breathe more or less. 
Okay, so then when we do that, we're using the cerebral cortex. Also consider our limbic system. The limbic system is involved in our emotions. So we affect our breathing rate when we laugh or when we cry or when we have anger or different kinds of emotions. So the limbic system can also affect breathing. The autonomic nervous system can play a role as well. So in the initial video for the system, we talked about how the smooth muscles around the bronchial tubes can be regulated by the autonomic nervous system. So when we have a fight or flight response, we need to be able to dilate the bronchial tubes and we need to be able to move more air in. And then temperature, body temperature. If your temperature goes up, let's suppose you're not even exercising, you're just sitting in a sauna, your breathing rate will increase. Okay, we talked about that with the um, hemoglobin saturation curve as well. And then irritants. If you, have you ever walked outside and it's really cold and then it's windy and then for a split second you can't breathe? Okay, so we can regulate uh, the opening, the dilation of our bronchial tubes based on either irritants like temperature or if there's a bunch of pollen or something that you're allergic to or some kind of a gas that is irritating. Um, even sometimes it affects people if you cut jalapeno peppers and the vapor that comes off of them can make your airways close up a little bit. So our airways can be controlled by irritants that we're breathing. Our body is going to want to close that off to reduce the amount of irritants getting into the body. And then the last thing that I want to mention is drugs or medications. Something like Alcohol, for example. Alcohol can suppress the medulla oblongata. People can die from alcohol poisoning because they don't breathe enough. Okay, so alcohol can inhibit the medulla oblongata and then you can't get enough oxygen. Also drugs like morphine. Morphine is an opiate, a painkiller that can suppress your diaphragm and decrease the muscle contractions that move air in and out. And then the other one that I want to mention is anesthetic. So anesthetic, a general anesthetic, if you're going to have a surgery, that can affect your respiration rate. So there's many different factors that can affect our breathing rate and depth.